So good morning, everyone. Hello from Austin, Texas. Thanks for jo joining us today uh, and welcome to today's webinar, the Metadata Support Gathering. My name is Elliot Williams. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the DPLA Aggregation Service Coordinator here at Texas Digital Library. Uh, also with us today are several other folks from TDL, including our Executive Director, Christy Park, Deputy Director, Courtney Muma, Communications Director, Leah DeForest, and our Digital Librarian, Ima Adwak. On behalf of all of us uh, at TDL, thanks so much for joining us today. So first, as always, a little housekeeping. Um, please keep your microphones muted if you aren't speaking, but we love to see your faces if you want to show them. So feel free to show, show your video or turn it on when you're speaking um, or keep it off if that's what you're feeling today. We hope you'll use the chat box um, to say hello and let others know you're here, as well as make comments, ask questions, and share resources throughout the webinar. Um, chat is also where we'll be sharing out some links uh, related to some things we're talking about today. Um, I'm hoping this will be a really interactive discussion-based webinar, so do please feel free to share questions um, and, and share your thoughts throughout. Um, if at any point you'd like to ask a question or share a comment anonymously, you can do that by chatting privately to Courtney Muma. Um, and she will share your comment without attributing it to you. To do that, um, when you go to the chat area in Zoom, just select Courtney's name from the drop down menu after two, and your chat will go just to her. Live captioning has been enabled, and you can view live captioning by clicking on the closed caption button on your toolbar. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. We will um, publish slides and recordings on our website and in the TDL repository. And I'm seeing that I didn't have live transcription enabled, so I am doing that now. Sorry about that. Uh, we at Texas Digital Library are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone here today be considerate and respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning, discriminatory, or harassing behavior and speech, and be mindful of your environment and of your fellow participants. And again, a reminder that we are recording this webinar. And finally, Texas Digital Library is grateful to our members, many of whom are here today, who put your trust in TDL to provide essential library infrastructure and services, such as digital preservation, digital repository hosting, tools for managing electronic theses and dissertations and research data, support for open educational resources, and metadata aggregation for DPLA. We invite any institution interested in becoming part of our consortium to reach out to us. We need your energy and expertise to continue growing the digital library community in our region and invite you to co connect with our really wonderful, uh, brilliant, fun community of librarians and archivists. So again, welcome to today's webinar all about metadata and supporting each other in metadata work. Um, I love this image that my colleague Leah found to promote this webinar uh, because I really like the metaphor of metadata as a trapeze that helps launch our collections into the hands of our users. Um, and I also like it because sometimes this is what metadata work feels like, right? Um, launching ourselves into the air, hoping someone is there to catch us, not being 100% sure that we're gonna, not going to fall on our faces. Um, and so that's that's what we're here to do today, to, to make sure that TDL is here to catch you and to help us all be the safety net for each other. So here's sort of the agenda for today's webinar. Um, we're going to do a quick icebreaker activity to get us in the headspace of thinking about metadata. Um, then I'll share some brief introductory information about shareable metadata and metadata aggregation. And then the bulk of our time together will be discussion, um, talking about how you do metadata work, what issues you have, what ideas you have, um, and just a, a time for us to learn from each other. I have some discussion topics and questions that folks submitted in advance, um, but I'm hoping we'll talk about whatever y'all are interested in talking about today. We do have a community notes document for this webinar, um, which we'll share the link to in chat. Please feel free to take notes in that document, add links to resources, et cetera, um, but I won't be actively monitoring that document during the webinar. So if you have questions to ask or um, resources to share, please also share them here in Zoom. So I thought we could start with a little icebreaker activity today um, because I think they're fun, even though I know everyone else thinks they're cringe, um, just to kind of get us thinking about metadata and, and get things going um, and get a sense of what other people's ideas and perspectives are. So we're going to use Mentimeter for this, which will show everyone's anonymous responses in real time to these questions. Um, so Courtney's going to paste this link in chat that you also see on the screen, um, or you can scan the QR code if you're feeling fancy and want to do it on your phone. 
And I'm now going to attempt to switch to slides. Here we go. All right. So the first question is, what are some characteristics of high quality metadata? What, what do you think about when you think about good metadata? Ooh, and we're seeing some answers come in. I love it. Consistent is a big one, which I think is great, not surprising. Um, controlled vocabulary is interoperable. Wow, I wasn't expecting it to move around quite so much while it was doing this. Shareable, inclusive, multilingual, descriptive, concise, informative, accessible, understandable. These are all really great. Thank you all. Returns useful results. I love that. Empowering. Ooh, empowering. That's a good one. Accurate, detailed, interoperable, linked. Cool. This is awesome. Thank you all. So let's move on to the second question, which sneakily is two questions in one. Um, what do you love about metadata work? What's challenging for you when you think about your work with metadata? You can answer either, both. Ooh, solving mysteries. That I uh, yes, I I totally feel that being detail oriented, accessibility, like solving a puzzle, puzzles and mysteries. Yeah, learning about new topics. Mm, being detailed without overwhelming users, user centric, challenging software platform. Yes. Reading metadata across multiple formats can be challenging. It can be difficult to balance community responsive and inclusive needs. Ooh, uncomfortable with responsibility. Who am I to decide on these keywords? That's a good one. Yeah, I think I have felt that way too. Yeah, the time and labor in input required. Organizational buy-in can be challenging. Serving all types of users, love that. Being exposed to interesting collections. Ooh, wanting examples for everything. Interesting. Yeah, I can see that as a, a challenge. Learning new tools and best practices is sort of the continual challenge, I think. Yeah. Control vocabulary is falling short of our needs, getting different standards, talking to each other. Ooh, sometimes need to be decisive in a field with so many options. Yes, sometimes I feel like I can spend hours on one item and like at some point you just have to, to make a decision. This is awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing these these things you love and these challenges that you have. Um, I'm really excited to, to talk more about some of these as we go along. So I'm gonna switch back over here. Are y'all seeing the slides again? Look good, cool. All right, well, thank you again for-, for I believe um, it's not full screen yet, oh, though. You might wanna do that. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Courtney. Um, yeah, thank you all for for sort of doing that icebreaker with me. That was really interesting. Um, so at Texas Digital Library, a core part of our mission is supporting broad and equitable access to digital research, teaching, and cultural heritage materials. Um, and I think all of us who are here today would agree that metadata is absolutely a prerequisite for access, right? Um, the work that goes into creating metadata is what makes access possible. It makes our materials findable, usable, understandable. Um, and I, 
I want to suggest today too that that access can be magnified when we think about metadata that's shareable. That is metadata that can be used and understood outside of its original context. Uh, metadata gets shared in all sorts of ways. It gets shared with discovery systems like Primo and Blacklight, with aggregators like the Digital Public Library of America and subject specific aggregators, with Google Scholar, with any number of places. And I think that thinking about what metadata looks like outside of your system can be a really interesting way to look at your metadata in new ways and create metadata that's easier for people to use, um, that provides more information and context about your resources, and ultimately helps more people find and use your materials. And even if you don't ever share your metadata anywhere or think that you'll don't think that you'll ever share your metadata, um, I think that a lot of these kind of shareable metadata principles can still be helpful in creating quality metadata that will make your materials more discoverable in your digital repository. And one of the ways that I think share, considering shareability can help metadata overall is that it encourages you to look at your metadata as a whole, not just as individual records. So thinking about, are you being consistent across collections, um, both in terms of what control vocabulary terms you're using and how you're using fields? Um, are you creating metadata records that can stand alone and don't require a lot of background knowledge about the items and their provenance to understand? Um, thinking about those kind of shareable metadata characteristics can help your improve your metadata, um, no matter if you're sharing it or not, and can help promote greater access to your materials. Um, we're going to put a link in the chat to some additional resources about shareable metadata, um, and I'd love to hear from y'all if you think um, if you think this is a useful way of thinking about metadata, if if this is something you think about in your work. So those of you who know me and know my work at TDL um, won't be surprised that part of why I think shareable metadata is valuable is because it makes it easier for collections to be discovered through the Digital Public Library of America. Um, TDL helps our members share their digital cultural heritage collections with DPLA through Text Hub and our metadata aggregation service, which I wanted to just give a little bit of info today in case folks aren't familiar with it. Um, as I'm sure many of you do know, the Digital Public Library of America is a project that aggregates digital cultural heritage materials from institutions around the country. Um, it currently includes metadata for over 47 million items. Uh, I checked this morning. It's growing all the time. It's up from when I took this screenshot earlier this year. Um, and all of those items are searchable through DPLA's site, and users who want to view the full item are then linked back to the item in its original institution's repository. TexHub is the Texas hub of DPLA. I know it's a very uh, clever name. Uh, and it's the pathway for Texas institutions to share materials with DPLA. TexHub is a joint project of the Texas Digital Library and the Portal to Texas History at UNT. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, the Portal to Texas History provides services for digitizing, hosting, and creating metadata for digital collections. And metadata from materials in the portal has been shared with DPLA for many years. Um, and TDL's DPLA aggregation service enables institutions that host their own digital collections, no matter what system they use, to share metadata about those materials with DPLA. So whether you host your own collections or share them through the portal to Texas history, your institution can be a part of DPLA. If you're interested in talking more about TDL's DPLA aggregation service, um, I hope you'll reach out to me. I'd love to talk with you more about it. So that's... That's all for my kind of talking. That's it's time for me to stop talking and time for us to all have a discussion. Um, so thanks to everyone who submitted questions and topics in advance through the registration form. Um, we got some really excellent questions and things folks want to discuss. So I have some slides where I kind of pulled out some of the things that were submitted um, and tried to group them into similar themes. We may or may not have time to get to all these things today. Um, so if we don't get to some of the topics, I'll definitely keep track of them for future events. For each topic, I've listed some of the questions we received through the registration form, um, not attributed to individual people, but if you'd like to speak up if it was your question and elaborate on it, please feel free. I and mean, I've also added some discussion questions that, that we can use as a place to start, but again, whatever y'all wanna talk about today um, would be great. Um, I have some tips and recommendations related to some of them that I'll share as we go along, um, as well as some resources that I'll uh, post in the chat. Um, and lastly, again, feel free to participate however you feel most comfortable. You can unmute, you can and speak out loud, you can type in the chat. Um, again, if there's something you want to share or ask anonymously, you can chat it privately to my co colleague Courtney Muma, who will then read it to the group. Um, we had, again, really great questions and topics submitted, so we might not have time to get to all of them. Um, so I created a quick Zoom poll to get a sense of what we're most interested in talking about as a group. So I'm going to launch that now. I'm going to try to launch that now. 
Here we go. So if you want to just select which topics sound good to you, um, just to, again, to kind of help us get a sense of where to start and what folks want to talk about. Um, and if there's something you wanted to talk about that you don't see listed here, please also uh, drop that in chat and we can go from there. Leave it open for just another second to let folks get their votes in. All right, thanks. So not surprisingly, we want to talk about everything. So that's <laughs> that's great. Um, cool. So control vocabularies, elements and application profiles, assessment and remediation, kind of the top ones. Sweet. Then let's talk about control vocabularies. Since that had a good number of votes. Um, so we had some questions about what control vocabularies you do you apply when, how do you use subject headings? Um, so I'd love to hear from y'all. What what control vocabularies do you use and how do you choose them? Like when you're thinking about control vocabularies to use, what what goes into that decision making process? Elaine says, see what categories are used by other areas or organizations in the sector or industry. Yeah. Elaine, I'm curious how you or or if if you know strategies for doing that. Um, like how, how do you go about finding out what other what other folks are using? Oh, I see Elaine, thanks, cool. Oh, Katie mentions who our users are and what other systems does ours need to talk to. I think that's a great point. Oh, yeah, Devin, thanks for, for saying something about using sort of local terms and alternative thesauri when kind of the big the big vocabularies fall short. Um, can you say a little bit more about how you identify those those shortcomings? Or or when when you make that decision to to kind of deviate from the the big ones? Thanks, Devin. And while you're typing that, I see James mentioned the National Agricultural Library, I assume is what NAL mentions, which that's that's interesting. That's not a vocabulary I've ever used, but I've also never really worked with agricultural material. So it makes sense that there would be a sort of specialized vocabulary for that. Whitney, that's a great point about how systems can kind of constrain to greater or lesser degrees what sort of freedom you have in using vocabularies.
Yeah, Jeanette, thanks for mentioning fast for geographic headings and subject terms. Um, that was something I was I was going to mention as well, especially kind of thinking about shareability that um, that control vocabulary like fast that focus more on sort of small individual subject terms rather than kind of complex strings are often better. Um, that's something that it has taken me a while to come around to because I, you know, I used to be a mark cataloger and so I was very used to like the long complicated subject strings, um, but I'm not sure that's actually the most helpful in um, in digital collections and especially in kind of aggregated environments. Devin, thanks for providing some more information about how you're working with um, kind of different all different vocabularies and different alternative vocabularies. Susan, I, I saw your comment about the migration and kind of simplifying and pulling together different subject fields into one. That's really interesting. Um, I've, I've seen that kind of practice of having different fields for different vocabularies and have always wondered how much duplication there really is among those. I can also quickly um, comment on that because that's that's a UH. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Bethany. Yeah. Um, so we um, have a local vocabulary manager software. Um, so basically, um, a part of the kind of evaluation that we did for the subjects was, um, you know, looking at how things were formatted in these different vocabularies and deciding which one we wanted to use. Um, so, you know, we, we enter the term um, the way that we think is the most appropriate, but then we say that like the close matches and we link to what uh... it is or AAT, you know, that, that kind of thing, so. Um, and ideally in the future, we will add in some more, um, you know, link data capabilities than just that, but at least, you know, we kind of have the, you know, framework in place, so, yeah. Thanks, Bethany. That's, that's really interesting and helpful. Um, I live in envy of your vocabulary management tool. I think it's, it's such a great, helpful thing. Does it have a name? Is it something? Is it was it built in house? Is it something we can use? It's um, the the software is called IQVoc, and um, let me get some links and I'll put those in the chat. That would be awesome. Thank you. And I also want to note Mark's comment um, asking if folks would link to local controlled vocabularies in the the community notes doc. I think that would be really helpful. I would definitely love to see those too. I see Alvin's comment as well about different different projects and different systems using different vocabularies, which I think is is a common situation for sure. I'm also going to drop a link in the chat to um, a subject metadata guide from the Illinois Digital Heritage hub, I think is what the second H stands for, that kind of talks about post-coordinated versus pre-coordinated subject strings and and when it's more helpful to use sort of sub shorter subject strings that I found really helpful. Bethany, thanks for those, those links to your vocabulary and that system. Devin, I see your comment as well about um, using sort of reconciliation services to speed up that processing of the more standardized terms to free up more kind of time and energy for focusing on um, inclusive terminology and alternative terminology. Oh, and James mentions backstage for authority control. I think they're a, a vendor who does a lot of authority control for, for many libraries. I don't know of anyone who uses backstage for kind of non-MARC metadata, but maybe folks do. 
Oh, and John mentions Markive as well. Any other thoughts about controlled vocabularies? This has been really interesting. We can definitely come back to this if folks have more thoughts. But I'm going to move us on to another topic, sort of broadly. This is, then this is a very broad topic, elements and application profiles. Um, so there were some really interesting questions that came through as folks were registering about best uh, kind of required metadata fields, as well as I really love this question about the balance between too much and too little metadata. Um, and then there was a question as well about sort of changes to expect to make additional fields to add to get collections ready for DPLA. Um, so I, I'd be really interested in folks' thoughts about required elements. Um, how do you all approach what fields are required for, for a, a metadata record to be sort of a, a minimally viable record? Do you have a list of required elements that every record must have? Mark, thanks for sharing that link. I thought minimally viable record was a term I had seen used at UNT. I thought that's why it was in the back of my mind, so thanks. <laughs> Or any thoughts about the the balancing too little versus too much metadata? How do you how do you know what's what's the right amount? What's the what makes a, a complete enough record? Yeah, Alvin, go ahead. Hi, Elliot. Um, I was just going to mention that. I I've been working with a metadata application profile for a project I'm working on at uh, my library at the National Library of Medicine. And I'll just say that we had many data elements that we uh, marked as required before we actually started trying to ingest uh, repository metadata. And then we realized a lot of the things that just conceptually we thought, oh, well, every repository is going to have this, then we found they did not. Um, so what we had to do um, really kind of to validate our data once we started ingesting repositories was to uh, switch the car, uh, the constraint uh, for some of our properties from, you know, required to optional. Um, and so I, I, we thought that was pretty interesting. Some of what we yeah. thought was really the base level um, we weren't able to get. That is really interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Elvin. And thanks for everybody for sharing your documentation and such in the, the chat. I'm excited to dig into some of those. I'll share TDL's, uh, TDL has a, a set of DPLA metadata guidelines that a working group created a few years ago, if folks want to check that out as well. Um, but yeah, Alvin, I think that point about like, you think things are going to be required and then that doesn't always work out in practice. I think that's a, a pretty common experience. Whitney mentions that they're working on a, a map document for their department. Katie required fields are unique identifier, rights, title, and publisher. Yeah, that's, Katie, I'm interested that publisher is a required field. That's not one that I often see in kind of the required list. I don't know if you want to say any more about that, but. Oh, for state state publications, that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Thank you. Um, 
Jeanette mentions kind of different levels of completeness, minimal, standard, and full. That's a, that's a, a cool, I like that way of kind of categorizing. James, yeah, definitely. That's that's definitely, I think, the approach that DPLA takes to minimum required fields. DPLA just requires a title and a rights field. Um, obviously, you know, we hope things have more than that, but but yeah, I think practices, as you say, James, practices vary so much that it's hard to set a minimum. Again, kind of going back to to like Alvin, what you were sharing, that you think it'll be easy to have everything will have something, but, but it might not in practice. Susan, thanks for sharing those required fields and required if available. Yeah, Whitney, I think that's, that's often the challenge with required fields, right? Is like, what do you do when you don't know that information or you don't have that information available. I think I think that's why a lot of us fall back on kind of required if available, sort of as Susan is saying as well. Jeanette, thanks for sharing your required fields as well. And subject, hmm, cool. Yeah, I think type is a really useful kind of baseline field as well, since it's it's pretty easy to determine and, and makes can be really valuable in sort of helping users get access to the materials they want. Oh, Bethany, thanks for sharing that about date as well. I've, yeah, I've seen a lot of places that will have date as sort of required or highly recommended. And, and as you're saying, sort of, we'll say, if you don't know the date, make a guess, which I think it, to me, it seems like that would kind of depend on what, sort, what sorts of materials you're working with is how, how valuable those guesses can really be. This might be like a specific um, tax hub um, question, Elliot, but dates is just like won't let me go today. And I, I guess my worry is that if there's no date and somebody's looking for something in the 1950s, that it won't, that the filter won't catch it if there's no date. You know what I mean? And so then I'm like, oh, okay, I need to at least, you know, I can't just leave it blank or else it's never going to show up in any like dated searches. So I think that's where, or, or, or facets, I think that's where I was getting a little bit stuck on, on dating. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's why a lot of folks have that require or requirement or recommendation to at least put a range or some kind of approximate date for exactly that reason, right? That even if you don't know, oh, it was on January 15th, 1954, you could say 1950s. But then it gets into, as some folks are kind of talking about in the chat as well, sort of how do you format those dates? Do those, does the system use those formatted dates to create filters in the way you expect it to, um, which isn't always, in my experience, isn't always as reliable as one might hope. Mark, thanks for sharing the the EDTF validation service. And Susan, I, that's I've seen that as well. That people and I have been guilty of this in the past as well. You know, saying it's EDTF, but really it's what we just think of as normal date formatting, which is not EDTF. Um, so there's, there's that can get really challenging, especially across institutions. Oh, Melanie, thanks for mentioning requiring language. Melanie, do you know if you require a field 
or if you require language to be filled out for kind of non-linguistic materials for for image strictly image materials is that a leave it blank or a or use the i think there's a code for no no linguistic material in the iso standard Not applicable. Thanks, Melanie. Yeah, ZXX. Thanks, Mark. Mm, Alvin, thanks. Yeah, that's interesting. So the sense I'm kind of getting is that there's a couple core fields that like almost that a lot of people require and then a little bit of variation in in what folks consider required which is interesting molly thanks for sharing how you handle kind of language for graphic materials that makes sense Yeah, Mark thinks, yeah, that that makes sense, kind of different, different requirements based on collections and material types that, yeah, I imagine a dissertation requires maybe the name of the department or the name of the advisor, which is obviously not a field that non-dissertation materials will have. Oh, creator, yeah, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Fairly important for a dissertation, yeah. And everyone will have one, right? Cool. Any any more thoughts about required elements? How you how you determine when a metadata record is complete? Any other thoughts about any of these topics before we move on? Yeah, Bethany, go ahead. Could I just quickly ask a question about the right Please. field? So I'm seeing on the slide here that rights is required. Um, and I'm curious, like, so I know there's a statement um, for rights not evaluated, which we have had to use before. And I'm just wondering, like, is that really accepted to use or is it kind of like, eh, it's not great, you know? I mean, it's definitely, it, you know, that counts. That counts as having a rights field. Um, and I think it's still, to me, so Bethany, if I understand your collection, your, excuse me, your question correctly, like does including the copyright not evaluated right statement from rightstatements.org, like does that count as having a rights field? Um, yeah, I mean, like, I guess there's a value in the field, but I'm just wondering if it's like kind of like, uh, we would prefer to have the rights actually be evaluated kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, I would, I would say that that is true, that we would prefer to have the rights be evaluated and kind of think about DPLA specifically, they would say they prefer to have the rights be evaluated. Um, and the idea, the idea behind the rights field and the idea behind standardized right statements is you're providing information to users to know what they can really do with the material. Um, so the copyright not evaluated right statement, it doesn't really provide a lot of information to the user. What it does tell them is that there's there's more than that. There's a reason it's blank, right? Um, like if, if there's just no right statement, then essentially that provides literally zero information and that then the user doesn't know, like, should mm -hmm. I reach out to this institution, you know, copyright not evaluated provides a little bit of information, but, but again, it, it's better when possible 
to have um yeah to have a, an actual right statement even if that right statement is um rights undetermined but i would say i wouldn't use the rights undetermined statement unless there's a reason it's undetermined like we we don't know who the creator is we don't know when it was created then mm -hmm. that's copy, then that's to me that's rights undetermined versus copyright not evaluated is we haven't tried does yeah. that make sense is that yeah we so we i think there's maybe only a few collections that we used the copyright not evaluated and it was just because you know it was a larger collection and we didn't have time to look at you know every single item um just to like finish our migration so maybe that's something i'll um look at and evaluate like what could we do before we you know try to get our stuff into dpla yeah yeah i mean but i also see melanie melanie's comment in the chat which i really agree with that saying copyright having a copy copyright not evaluated statement is better than not making the collection available um, until someone has time to evaluate it and i would say that that that's i agree with that really strongly and i would say that that's true of dpla as well right i mean it's not it's i would say it's not worth waiting to put it waiting to share it more broadly until you have the time to do that rights analysis you know some access is better than no access so and and some information is better than no information so thanks y'all yeah thanks that's a great question bethany and devin i see the link you shared in the chat about uh, the guide from fordham which is great and is a really useful one so thanks for sharing that. Also some folks sharing resources about um, metadata for ETDs, which is great. Thanks, Susan. All right. So I think one of the other topics that folks were really interested in, in talking about today was assessment and remediation. So I'm gonna go ahead and move us on. Um, to that so so there were there were quite a few questions that folks submitted about um, how are you assessing metadata um, how do you remediate metadata on particularly on kind of a large scale what tools are folks using for that um, enhancing metadata with linked data so i'd love to hear what folks are doing around metadata assessment do you have workflows for assessing metadata quality um, what tools and strategies do you use is that part of your kind of metadata process? I think we talk a lot about creating metadata and maybe a little less about assessing and going back to metadata later on. And while folks are thinking about that, I'll go ahead and share a couple of resources um, the folks at UNT, Hannah Tarver and Mark Phillips, Mark's here today, have a great um, framework that they've been working on called the EPIC, EPIC assessment framework um, around assessing metadata, um, which I find really interesting and useful. Um, and the DLF metadata assessment working group also has a lot of great resources that I think are worth digging into. Oh, Mark, and I just saw that you are also sharing the work that Hannah's doing, so thanks for that. I felt like saying jinx. But, uh... <laughs> mm, Susan, that's a great point that assessing metadata requires a way to extract it in bulk. Yes, I agree. Um, at least most systems don't don't provide a lot of assessment within the within the system that manages the metadata, so you have to get it out, which some systems make easier to do than others. Elaine says, just starting to build a workflow um, for this. Trying to aggregate some of our existing mandatory items and try to integrate best practices, yeah. Alvin says, enhancing metadata with linked data by uh, mapping keywords to mesh and then looking up the mesh URIs. That's really interesting.
Alvin, what kind of tools are you using to do that um, mapping to mesh and then adding the URIs? If you so there, there is um, uh, at the National Library of Medicine, we have the eUtilities API, which um, has a lot of the uh, database information from NLM and NCBI products and services. Um, so I, I work with the programmers. I don't know exactly how they're doing this, but we can look up not only every mesh preferred term, but all the entry terms that go along with it, and then match that to a repository supplied. And by repository, we're looking at biomedical repositories that hold data sets. Um, and so we're not doing any fuzzy matching. We're looking for a one-to-one, -one, but we can gotcha. match the keyword off of an entry term and not just a preferred term. And then when we do get a match, we keep the repository supplied keyword, but then we supplement it with an additional, um, for us, we call them concepts, um, an additional concept of a mesh RDF URI. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, mesh is, is helpful in that it provides those entry terms as well as the, the term itself. Devin shared a little bit as well about remediating on a long on a large scale, getting a snapshot of the data, using tools like OpenRefine to quickly clean reconciliation services, um, and then exporting into CSVs that then can be transformed into other formats as needed. Thanks, Devin and Mark, for both sharing all those great links in the chat. Oh, Susan, that's such a great question. How many of us make the space and time for assessment or does it take a backseat to the backlog of metadata creation? I, I would also really love to hear how folks balance sort of assessment versus creation with the reality of limited time and resources. Whitney mentions that there are students who do the majority of the metadata creation, so that leaves her open for focusing more on assessment and remediation. That's interesting. Susan, that's interesting. I see your comment about open refined reconciliation, not thinking of that as remediation, but part of the metadata creation. That's, that's interesting. Um, I've never worked in a situation where I was able to kind of use that as part of the metadata creation process. So to me, that has always come after creation, but I guess it depends on sort of how your workflows are set up. Yeah, Molly, I see your comment about just being sort of the sole metadata creator analyst. Um, so prioritizing metadata creation. Alvin, yeah, I, again, I think it comes down to a lot to how the system facilitates that kind of assessment, how easy it makes it, which then affects how much time you have to spend on it. Melanie says a lot of meta metadata assessment comes in waves from sort of special initiatives. I think that's pretty common, yeah. Gabby, I see your comment as well about sort of that, that again, these aren't kind of fully separate processes that if you review the metadata and, and do more of that work during the creation and ingest phase, then maybe it doesn't need to be a set remediated or assessed in the same way down the line. Although I'd argue that also that like, you know, practices change, systems change. So we, we might change what we want to do down the line as well. But I think that's a great point. Melanie, I saw your question a few minutes ago as well about sort of, is anyone assessing traditional cataloging slash mark records and digital collection description holistically? And kind of the disconnect that exists between these disparate buckets of data and kind of ecosystems of data. 
I'd be really curious to hear if any folks are doing any work in that area, kind of com comparing or or assessing mark records and digital collection records together. And again, kind of thinking about like, do those work together in one discovery system, for example? Is anyone is anyone thinking about that? Elaine, I also see your comment about being at a, a small organization and just kind of starting to starting to do this work and figuring out best practices and, and future planning. I think that's an exciting but kind of stressful place to be sometimes. Mm, Susan, thanks for that comment about the kind of idea of good enough in software development and translating that into good enough metadata. And the perfect is the enemy of the good. Yeah. I definitely know for myself, and I think this is true of a lot of us who go into metadata work, like I want it all to be perfect. I want it all to be, you know, I want to really get in there and make sure everything is just right. And while it would maybe be nice to have the time and resources to do that. Who among us does have the time and resources for that? And yeah, so going back to the idea of like, some metadata is better than no metadata, some access is better than no access. Yeah, MPLP, Molly, exactly. More product, less process. Melanie, thanks for sharing that additional kind of context around sort of thinking about holistic assessment since migrating into Alma and Primo and kind of now everything is coming together in Primo for discovery, as well as having some sort of focus on um, remediating harm harmful language. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting part about a lot of the initiatives around inclusive metadata um, that it, it does bring together folks working in different descriptive traditions and descriptive um, description systems to kind of talk together in ways that we maybe don't as often as we ought to. Oh, Misu, that's interesting using Alma for kind of lots of different kinds of uh, metadata description, mark Dublin Core and mods as needed. That flexibility, I bet, is really comes in really handy sometimes. Oh, Kelsey, that's I see your comment about kind of different coming from museum cataloging, where items are often changed by users and, and rarely fit the controlled vocabulary perfectly. That's really interesting. I have I have no experience with museum cataloging, so that's that's interesting. Susan, I see your comment as well about MPLP doesn't mean more product, no process, which I think is a great point as well. Um, and Devin, your comment as well about good enough efforts should focus on on kind of focusing, we should focus our efforts on kind of ethical and critical metadata issues and less on other aspects that are not as critical, kind of really focusing, choosing what we focus on um, and, and putting our values into play there as well. Katie, that's a, an interesting point about kind of the disconnect between Mark and digital collections metadata and um, kind of just linking between the two as opposed to um, trying to make sure they're exactly the same. I think that's a 
a really efficient way to to approach that problem. All right, y'all. Any more thoughts about this? We are just about at the hour, so I'm going to start wrapping us all up. But if there's any final, final thoughts. All right. Then I am going to bring us to a close here today. Uh, this has been phenomenal. Thank you all so much. Um, it's been a great discussion. I've learned a ton. Um, have a lot of new things to think about. So thank you all. Um, we will share out the captioned recording of today's webinar as soon as we can. I'm also going to grab all of these links that were shared in chat and make sure they're all in the community notes document. Um, we are planning to do more events related to metadata in the future, so I hope you'll join us again. Um, we're thinking about maybe some semi-regular uh, informal metadata office hours or Twitter chats or something like that. Um, so if you're interested in, in those, please let me know, and I'd love to talk about what would be useful to you. Um, and as a final remember, we here at TDL would love to have you join us. Uh, please email us at info at tdl.org if you'd like to learn more about TextHub and DPLA metadata aggregation or any of our other services. Um, thanks again for joining us. Take care and have a great rest of your day. Susan, it's not a regular meeting yet, but if it becomes one, I will definitely let you know. Thanks, everybody. Misu, yes, I will share the chat file um, with everybody who registered for the event. Thanks.